Sir. Uh, when your book came out, I requested it from the library. I was number 84 on 24 copies. And I still don't have it. I'm up to about maybe 40. But I just finished Border Wars, which is a similar book. And they mentioned uh, the evilness of Stephen Miller. Your thoughts on him? He, he's, um, he, Stephen's an interesting character in the White House. <laughs> um, you know, we actually don't delve too much into him as a character in our book. And for a couple of reasons, we do uh, deal with immigration in a very stable genius, but it's not an immigration book. Um, Julie Davis and Mike Shear are friends of ours and, and colleagues and wrote Border Wars. New York which Times. Is New York it's Times reported. Wonderful book. And, and did a wonderful book all about the Trump immigration crisis. This is more about Trump yeah. as a president and the character. But a, a couple of thoughts about Miller. He, um, to the extent that there's a Trump sort of ideologue, Stephen is it. I mean, he's embodied the Trump agenda from day one, um, and not only on immigration, but, but on trade. The powers uh, attributed else. to him, the powers attributed to him are true. They right? are true. It's extraordinary the yeah. amount of influence that he has in the White House. And you guys will remember from the 2016 campaign, uh, he came on as a, as a press aide for Senator Jeff Sessions and rose up very quickly to be Trump's speechwriter, policy advisor, uh, opening act on the campaign trail. And now he runs that West Wing. There is not a single thing this government does on immigration or border security that Stephen Miller does not personally uh, approve or, or get involved in. Uh, but his influence goes beyond. He's writing the speeches that the president delivers, State of right. the Union, the rallies, and, and so forth. It's great to see, uh, Carol, uh, that book, your book, there are so many books that are in this genre now on the best, I think there's like three of the top 12 books, four of the top 12 books are all books about what's actually going on. It's kind of a WPA program, right, for, <laughs> for journalists reporting on this stuff. This administration well, is- we kind of need it in journalism. Well, I guess. As you know. So. <laughs> Stipulated. Hi, Randine, how are you? Thanks. Good, what, what's your question? Um, with Biden's momentum, the last 24 hours, and should he, should it carry him to the nomination? Where do you see uh, the Trump administration's ability to pull Burisma yeah, right. and overtake the whole yeah. narrative? I confess I'd unbookmarked my Burisma Wikipedia page <laughs> after <laughs> Iowa. I've had to go rebookmark it. The president will use that to full effect. Um, he will, I would imagine, um, resurface that issue in the campaign. His campaign will definitely talk about it. You, you still see it even literally yesterday. There were uh, Trump supporters tweeting about Biden and Burisma again and how there has never been a fair investigation. Yeah. Um, you know, to be clear, I mean, we're not partisan, we're objective reporters. There is something a little bit odd about Hunter Biden making $50,000 for a job for which he had no really previous experience, um, and, and that was as, as a board member. There's something strange about that. That doesn't mean that there was a crime involved, which is what the president has. Has there, alleged. Carol, been adequate reporting on that subject? I think The Post and The Times have done some very good work, and I would recommend a piece by my colleague, Michael Cranish. Um, there's probably more to be done, to be, to be fair, but, right. there, but, but the, he, Michael did a very yeah. good definitive work on and that. And Biden is going to have to answer this more fully and thoughtfully. He's engaged the subject here and there, but he has not sort of given a full accounting. And for his own sake, sooner happened. rather than later. If yeah, he wants and, and it, would be, it would be helpful to him, I think, to do that. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was interesting that on Sunday, the day after the South Carolina win, Senator Ron Johnson suddenly started yeah. asking for documents related to Joe Biden after we hadn't heard word one about Burisma for weeks when Biden not, was down in the trough. Not right? by accident. Not by accident. Yeah. Yeah. Sir. Uh, thank you for what you do. I'm honored to meet you. Thank you. Uh, despite the continuous and overwhelming evidence that would make one question the competency of this president, a significant number of Americans continue to support him. He does not have a fringe element supporting him. It's at least, what, third, 40 percent of the country. Why do you think that remains in place? I think, I, first of all, you're, you're absolutely correct that it is not a fringe element. Um, I cover a lot of Trump rallies for the Washington Post and spend time interviewing people at these rallies, and they're not fringe people. They're nurses and teachers and run coffee shops, and they're very much a part of the fabric of, of all of the communities around this country. And they support him for you know, legitimate, passionate reasons. They feel like he's their champion. They feel like they've been ignored for many years by the governing class in Washington. They are convinced that he is fighting for their interests, even though 
there are plenty of legitimate arguments to be made that he's not exactly fighting for the interests of the working people, but they are convinced of that. Um, and I think more than that, they look at the economy and, and all of the economic indicators are fairly strong uh, the last couple of weeks withstanding. Uh, and we'll see what happens over the long run with coronavirus and the markets. But for the most part, this has been a pretty good economy, uh, even though a lot of working and middle class people are not feeling the effects of that. And, and so people feel like he's, you know, they don't like the tweets, they don't like the tone, they don't like the bullying aspect, but things are pretty good. Yeah. And, and, they, and that's why his approval rating is, is as high as it is despite all of the scandals and despite all of the divisive rhetoric. Carol, you work for the Lion Amazon Washington Post. We're here on BSPBS, right? That's probably what he would say. Do you think that we, in our side of this conversation, fully appreciate and understand the mindset of the people who voted for him then, will vote for him again, live in the middle of the country, say, in a cliched sense, but mm -hmm. there's some truth to that? I'm so glad you asked the question, because one thing that Phil and I talk about at some of these book events is, you know, a, a really unanswered question for a large group of people who support Donald Trump, for me anyway, is if he is not, if he is doing things that are actually detracting from your economic well-being, as we've uh, documented at the Washington Post, if he's not delivering on the campaign promises that he made to the working uh, people, if he's not really reshaping like health care the way he said he would reshape health care, why is it that you, that you still stick with him? And I think that it, as, an, as Americans, we have to ask the question, why is there a near civil war o about this? Why is there a group of people who feel so forgotten and disdained by the political establishment, by the elite of the Democrat and the Republican Party? And by the media. And by the media. Right? There's a piece of this where we're, we're not just referees, we're players. Right? But I we're, mean, absolutely. That, that's also been stoked by politicians for their own benefit, of course, right? Of course. And one real dangerous thing that we could talk about ad nauseum, and I'd love to talk about it, is... Um, but we, it's probably better for another day, is newspaper reporters are disappearing from so many of these communities. Yep. They're, they're disappearing. Re papers that used to be the golden age uh, in Minneapolis, in Arkansas, in so many places are a in shell Fort of... In Fort Worth, in El Paso. I mean, I can bring this right down Charlotte, to the level North of Texas. In Charlotte, North Carolina, in right? Philadelphia, you know, Pennsylvania. And when you don't have reporting in your community, it's really easy to start saying... It's really easy to start chiming in with fake news if you don't know reporters. Good, sir. Okay. I appreciate what you guys do and all this information that's coming out now that Trump is president. But I guess the question is, is it a fair question to say why was not more of this revealed before the election? I mean, the press seemed to almost promote Trump. I mean, they gave him a lot of free play. And there was a history that Trump had that he brought to the election with him, and it seemed like that history was not out there the way perhaps it was uh, with people going after Hillary. I mean, is that a fair question? You accept the premise? Not fully. Um, and, and I'm not going to sit here and defend CNN and, and what cable news did in showcasing his rallies uninterrupted and the call-in interviews and all of that. Um, but in the media as a whole, the information was there if, if you read it. Um, the Washington Post did a ton of rigorous investigative right. reporting into his background, including by David Farenfold right. um, that you mentioned, as did a number of other uh, outlets and organizations. Like, there's a reason we all know uh, that he sat on a tour bus with Billy Bush, we'll grab, I grab women by the you-know-what because I'm a star and they let me do it. That was reporting um, into Donald Trump's background. Yep. There's a reason we know about the taxes. There's a reason you know about uh, all the, the things, the bankruptcies, the, the womanizing comments, all that, uh, the assault allegations. And a lot of voters still decided to elect him president because it was a choice between him and Hillary Clinton, and they felt like he was yep. uh, in their interests and was going to be the president they wanted more so than her. Um, but I don't think they did it without knowing th that information about Trump's background. Carol, I'll retweet Phil here and say that he got elected not because we didn't know. He got elected despite the fact that yeah. we did know. Right? On hundred, I echo that, and I echo everything Phil said. It was there if people were going to read it. I mean, we published the Washington Post published an entire book called Trump Revealed, and chapter by chapter, it had every detail: the casino failures, the the mastery at marketing, the dishonesty, the frauds. Um, and honestly, let's be clear: Hillary Clinton was a toxic candidate to even people in the moderate and progressive ends of the Democratic Party. She had a lot of baggage and a lot of trouble, and, and, 
and that was an advantage to Donald Trump. Okay, thank you. Ma'am. Hi, I've been concerned about the ability that we'll have to learn the full truth about his presidency, so I really appreciate what you guys are doing. But I've heard, I've read that uh, the people that keep the records are no longer employed and that he has a habit of kind of shredding everything that they were putting back together and now there's no one to do this. So how do we go forward to have full knowledge about what's really happening now and in the next year? I can give that a whirl unless you'd like to. No, you go ahead, but there's one thing I want to point out, but you go first. I'm not sure what you mean about shredding. Um, I think people would know that. It, that. Maybe we should talk afterwards if you know about actual spoilation. <laughs> no, I'll, she's re you're referencing, there's a story that um, our friend Annie Carney wrote in Politico in the first year where Trump, the national, the, the law is that you have to preserve all documents, presidential documents for the National Archives, and Trump would rip them up like this and throw them in the wastebasket, and there's a staffer in the White House whose job was to take the pieces of paper <laughs> and tape them back together so that they could be preserved for the National Archives. I think that's what you right. mean by the shredding. Go ahead. Yeah. I should have let him take it. <laughs> no. No, it. By the way, it's one of my favorite stories about the Trump, uh, the Trump White House. It's it, really it is a, a challenge, read. though, to think about years later having to go back and reconstruct, right? It, I mean, that's, yeah. it is. That, that's one of the things that I sort of think historians have it easier now rather than harder because at least they have electronic records. And the challenge isn't just the documents being shredded, it's that there's not a process for decision making that you would normally have in the White House. So there, normally there'd be meetings among principals about creating decision memos and, and there'd be documentation to reconstruct how the president decided to do what he did and now it's, it's a tweet and you can go yeah. back and look at what was on Fox and Friends that morning, but there's right. not a, a formal process. Not, not to mention that the Ukraine scandal began in part because the transcript of a phone call, which, let's be honest, was not actually a transcript. Oh, so glad you said that. Right. Um, was, was put in a secure server. I mean, I don't know that there's a process for us to ever see that stuff. One day. One day. But, you know, there's another thing that's just rampant through this administration. We won't take too long, much longer on your question, but Jared Kushner and the president both have told people to leave the room and you can't be there to take notes. Well, that's part of the Presidential Records Act too. When the president's on yeah. the phone or meeting with a foreign leader, it should be transcribed, it should be kept forever. Jared's had off-book meetings. Jared Kushner, he and I are not on a first name basis, but he, <laughs> they have um, not kept very thorough and rigorous notes the way you would have. Ivanka Trump has had emails in which she was using personal emails, as had Jared, for official purposes. All of these things are in contrast to the way we keep records of a presidency. I'm just gonna look over the, thank you for your good question. I'm gonna look over the line and just ask Steve, are we good? We're good to have three more. Okay, these three and yes, that's sir. it. Okay, sir. Right, one thing first, I can testify that this section is usually empty. In fact, when Rick Wilson was here several weeks ago, there might have been four people over there. <laughs> well, so that's because, wanna... because that's because he cusses and people just don't want to <laughs> be around. <laughs> he does. <laughs> He does use the everything that everything that Trump touches is effed quite a bit. Yeah, he did. Um, but my real question is, it, and, and I consider the magnitude of the problem so huge, but the extent that the media and the Twitterverse and the whole social media thing just feeds this marketing BS that Trump feeds us. What can we do to slow that down and not have a repeat of 2016? I mean, there's so much disinformation out there from Parscale and, and Trump. Is there an answer? Right. Well, and you all are in the business of publishing an ongoing list of untruths told by the, it's the that's the Post's thing, right? Right, fact checker. We're in the Post truth. It's not era. like yeah. you're not, it's not like you're not telling us. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, there was a, a discussion in journalism in the first year of the presidency about what do we do with the president's tweets? Do we cover his tweets mm -hmm. or do we not? And I fall pretty firmly in the category of cover it. We can't ignore um, the information that the president or his campaign are putting out there, but what we can do as journalists is apply context. Um, we can explain to readers uh, what's true, what's not true what's the thinking behind it, understand the, the sort of broader contextual landscape, and, and that can add some value. We, you can't tune it out, though. It, like, it's always going to be there. He's entitled to say what he wants to say, 
Brad Parscale is entitled to do whatever push advertising on Facebook or Twitter or what have you that they want to do as a campaign, and that's between them and Facebook about whether the mm -hmm. stuff that's false is getting policed by Facebook. But we as, as journalists can just cover it, keep our eyes open, and, and add context and critical thinking yeah. uh, to help explain it And all. call BS when BS needs to be called. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Don't, don't go to the Salt Lake. It's, yeah. it's over. Right <laughs> I know this is going to come back to bite me. I know, I know it. I so wanted you to tell us what your favorite was last week. I've been a vegetarian since 1984. Uh, you you're, asking the, you're asking the wrong person, ma'am. Hi. Um, not that we could trust very much of what would come out of the press briefings with this administration, but do you think that, hopefully with a new administration, that there's been any permanent damage to the White House press briefings? I don't know about permanent damage because I am hopeful that this president will restart them, um, and I certainly hope the next president will. Um, but it's very, very worrisome, and Phil feels this more than I do on a regular basis, but I have stories pretty much all the time that involve calling the press office and asking for comment. And my batting average is getting lower and lower in terms of getting any response. And no, not just a negative response or a no, no comment, but just zero, a goose egg. Goose egg. And right. that's, I mean, the president stands out in the driveway or on the South Lawn um, or gets on, on Twitter and says what he wants to say, and he views himself as the best communicator. But some of the things he says aren't accurate. Some of the things he says, uh, don't answer the question that I have, so or that the Washington Post has. Or he's right. driving the narrative. And you need a, you should have a professional staff that can answer questions um, yeah. with with regularity, uh, daily regularity, and with consistency and with accurate information. And we don't have that. Phil, how and long has it been since there's been a White House press briefing? I believe more than a year. Um, the the current press secretary. I bet some people in this room don't even know her name because she's not held a press briefing. Uh, Stephanie Grisham, she replaced Sarah Sanders about a year ago. And, and just so everyone understands, uh, that job is, you, you are not the personal political spokesperson for the President of the United States. You are a taxpayer-funded uh, spokesperson for the entire federal government. You're supposed to be the face of the, of the U.S. government held accountable day in and day out to address the public, to answer questions about things in the news, to explain what the government's doing. Um, and, and Trump has completely reshaped that role right. in, in a way that the press secretary is, is you know, his well, political thank you for hand. What you do. Thank okay. you very much for your question. Last question, sir. Do you think or have you seen professionally any indication that we'll find out more about Trump's finances <laughs> And whether or not that will happen while he's in office or out of office. And then a second part is, you know, some really smart people told me, so I guess that means I created it myself, a comparison of what we see going on within the Republican Party being paralleled with apartheid and that a minority of people trying to keep control and taking it away through packing the courts. So two, two different questions, one about his finances and whether or not you think there's anything going on that appears to be apartheid-like with the Republican Party. So question number one, uh, I sure hope so, and it's something that the Washington Post is working on. Question number two, I think we're not qualified to make that comparison, and I would I would view it as sort of dangerous to start making the, that comparison. Every party wants to be in power. Um, I watch the Obama White House. I mean, they may be beloved here or they may be beloved down the street. I watch the Obama White House uh, fight tooth and nail to stay in power and um, use their bully pulpit for that purpose. That's just the way politics it's po it's is. It's politics, right? It's Phil, Phil, what's the likelihood that we're going to ever see the president's tax returns? I think very low, although there is a court, and, and I don't know the exact details of this, you've kind of caught me off guard, but there is the, the lawsuit going on in New York, New York State, State right, right now, yeah. which the president is paying very close attention to. It's the reason he keeps feuding with the governor of New York. Um, but they are efforting to get those tax returns, and I believe a judge ruled a few weeks ago. I'm not sure the outcome or whether we're ever going to actually see them, but, but it's moving yeah. through the legal process. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, you guys, man. Just so great. Um, thank you again for coming. Thank so you. So good to have you here. Everybody, please buy a book. Okay.